So, I want you to think in your mind right now of somebody that you greatly admire. Someone that you respect. Someone that you really love. Think of that individual right now. Now, I want you to think about what is it about that individual that you appreciate so much? What is it that, that just draws you to that person? What, what do you really like about that individual? If we were to just start taking answers from the audience and putting them up on the screen, and I, I don't want to list names because it would be embarrassing to have my name up there so many times. But if we listed the thing that, that draws you to that person, we would see an extensive list of characteristics that are all related to attitude. And I contend that the one thing that makes people attractive to other people is their attitude. Think about it. If you were to share that one special thing about the person you admire most, you would not say anything necessarily about their skill. You probably wouldn't say anything about their physical looks. In fact, I don't know anyone who would say that a person is their friend because they are good looking. Which leads me to conclude that either good looks are not all that important or you have ugly friends. You see, your attitude not only makes you attractive to other people, but for the next four weeks, I'm going to talk about managing the resources that God has given to all of us. And the thing that, that makes us attractive to God is not our abilities or our skills or our talents or our gifts. It is our attitude toward them and toward him and what we do with those resources that makes us attractive to our Heavenly Father. So if we're going to be covering this information over the next several weeks, I want us to have a working definition of the issue of stewardship. So write this down in your sermon sheet. Stewardship is utilizing God-given abilities to manage God-given resources to accomplish God-ordained results. I came across... A devotional when I put the sermon together and I want you to hear what it says. It's on the passage from Luke 21, the story of the widow who put two mites in the offering. And Jesus says in response to watching this occur, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all the rest. And then the devotional asks this question, how how is it possible to add together the offerings of countless rich men and declare the total less than two mites of a poor widow? How is it possible that so little could be so much? Jesus' arithmetic is not difficult to comprehend when you understand, as he did, that the secret of giving is not the amount of of giving, but rather what was given up. Attitude, not abundance, is the key. Jesus taught that liberality is determined not by the amount of our possessions, but by the disposition of our giving. Giving is not a function of cold numbers, but a result of a warm heart. It's the attitude. And that's why this is a true statement, and I want you to write this one down as well. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And we're going to get to the heart of, the, of that very matter today. We're, we're going to go right where we live, and there is no better story, I believe, in God's word to help us do that than the story that we find in Luke 10 of the Good Samaritan. Open up your Bibles to Luke 10. It's going to be on the screen as well, but you can follow along in your own Bible as well. Luke 10, beginning in the 25th verse, we read these words. Jesus said, on one, one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. 
You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, in this story, there are three different attitudes that are exhibited. And the first attitude that we come across in the story is this. What is yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. That's the attitude of the robbers. They, they looked at the man walking down the road from Jericho, and they said, you know what? What's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. So they beat him up, and they took his possessions. They robbed him. And Christians stand back and we say, we don't want anything to do with that kind of an attitude. That, that is the attitude of greed. One of the most classic scenes in any movie ever made, I believe, is, is a scene from the movie Wall Street where Michael Douglas and his character, he stands up in a stockholders meeting and he exclaims in these words, the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for a lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies. It cuts through and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge has marked the upward surge of mankind. And I thought for the Christian, greed has always been bad. It has always been out. Christians have always understood that what is yours is not mine, and I have no right to take it from you. But in the story that Jesus tells, that is the very first attitude that we see. One of Aesop's fables is a story of a dog who went into a butcher's shop, and he took pieces of meat in his jaws, and he ran out of the shop. Well, the dog wanted to go find a secluded place to go and savor the meat that he had stolen. And as the dog crosses a stream, he looks down and he sees his own reflection. But all he could see was another dog with meat in his jaws. So you know what he did? He opened his mouth to get what was in the mouth of the other dog and he lost all that he had. That is the pathway of greed. We, we need to take the, the stew out of stewardship. We need to realize that God is the owner of everything and that you and I are simply managers of what it is that he has given to us. God owns everything. We just manage. Now, in your outline, there are two columns and uh, I want you to see that the left-hand column speaks, up, speaks of the fact that, that we know that God is actually the owner and I am the manager. In the right-hand column, it would say, no, I'm the owner. I'm the owner of everything I have and it's all mine. Let me show you the difference between these two different attitudes and how they actually work out. On the left-hand side, under um, the manager column, I want you to put the word thankfulness because... I guarantee you, when you understand that God is the owner and that all you do is manage 
what he has given to you, then there's going to be a heart of gratitude. There will be a sense of thankfulness for what God has given and done for you. But on the other side, if, if you think that you are the owner, under the right-hand column, put this word. Put the word pride. Because if you think that you own everything, you will begin to be proud of what it is that you actually own. And you will say things like, look what I've done. Look what I have accomplished. Look how hard I have worked for all of this. So when I look at a person and I, I see their possessions and they're full of pride, they're you know, and what all they have, I understand that they, they really believe they own all of that stuff. But when I see a person that is very thankful for what is at their disposal, and I understand that they are stewards and they understand the issue of management. Under the management column, put the words master's kingdom. Because if you understand that, that God owns everything, that everything you have is for God. It's for his kingdom. It is for the master. But if you think that you own everything, on the right hand side, put my kingdom. Because everything that you work for, everything that you strive for, you will view as yours and that you own it. On the left hand side, put the word transient. Because every possession you have, Everything that God has given to you, you will understand it is yours for just a small period of time. It's here today and it is gone tomorrow. And many of the things that God has given to you aren't for yourself, but they are to pass on beyond you. On the right hand side, if you don't realize this, put the word permanent. Because you will treat possessions and things as permanent and you will place permanent value on it. You will put permanent effort into it and you will constantly think it's here today and it's always going to be mine. But if you understand under the management section, another idea, I want you to put this word, please another. Because everything that you do will be to please someone else. You know that God gives you things to, to pass on to others and you will realize this is not a solo trip. I am here to help my fellow man. Well, under the ownership side, I want you to put the words, please myself. And there's a lot of difference because you will treat all of your possessions as things just to please yourself. And you will constantly say, what gives me the greatest comfort? And you will be me-oriented. And you will think that, that those things are really just all yours. And here is the deal. Somebody goes down the road to Southwest 9th and Army Post and robs the quick trip. We would think that's terrible. And we understand in the earthly realm, the attitude that says what is yours is mine and I'm going to take it. We know that's wrong. People get hurt with that kind of an attitude. But, but in the spiritual realm, it seems to get a little fuzzy for us. For example, if you made $400 this week, how much of that is God's? Now, if you're sitting there saying $400, it's all God's. You're right. You understand stewardship. But if you were sitting there and you're thinking, well, uh, 410% of the tithe, that's $40 because that belongs to the Lord. Well, I've, I've got news for you. It's all God's. Every breath you take, every penny you save, everything that you, you go and buy because you just can't live without it, all of that, it's God's. Now, there was another attitude that we see in this story, and that is the attitude that says what's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. This is the attitude of the Levite and the priest. In other words, they were not going to go out and rob anybody. They weren't going to stick somebody up. They, they weren't that way. But the priest and the Levite operated under the attitude of what is mine is mine and I'm just going to keep it. And here's the weird thing. These guys were very, very religious people. It is the only time in the Gospels that you will ever see Jesus speaking in any way negatively about the priests, the ones that, that cared for the temple. More than likely, the, the priest and the Levite were going to the temple for their once a year weekly duty of caring for the temple. Many of the priests lived in Jericho and it wasn't a very long journey 
And there was a law that stated that a, a priest was not supposed to touch anything that was unclean, especially before he was uh, going to do the ceremonies in the temple. So, so when the priest and the Levite saw this man who was half dead, thinking he might already be dead, well, it would have been unclean. And they wouldn't be able to touch him. Basically, the law said, you cannot help that man. You cannot touch him because you're a priest. You're a Levite. And I want to stop here. Because I find it very interesting. I run into all kinds of legalistic people who basically have their set of rules and they, they follow their set of rules and somehow they, they can't see beyond their tunnel vision and realize that there are people on their right and people on their left and everything that they seem to be doing, they're doing it in the name of God and it just blows me away that there are people in need around them but they're so set on following rules, they can't figure out how to help people around them. They never help anybody because that's not the thing that they're supposed to be doing. And they're all bound up in their rules and their regulations and and people are dying and they're going to hell. But they would much rather debate a Baptist about Calvinism or something else. And that's wrong. That's the attitude that says what's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. They don't hurt anyone. They don't break any rules. They don't make any enemies. They just keep to themselves. They live in their little world. They draw a circle around their life and they they just plod along, isolated from reality. They treat life like a a picnic area. They they go out and have a picnic. They they have their basket of food and and linen and utensils and, and they go to a picnic table in a park and they spread out all of their stuff and they eat their food and when all of it's done, they pick up all of their stuff and they throw any of the trash away in a trash can and they look and they will say, see, I didn't make a mess. I left this just like I found it. And for a moment, we stand back and we think, you know, that's, that's pretty nice. But, but think with me. Who put the table in the park so that they could go and enjoy a meal? Who, who planted trees that would give them shade Who put the trash cans out there that they could throw their trash into? Who built the restrooms? See, those things deteriorate. And if somebody did something more at some point than just come to a park and sit down and eat, they gave so that somebody behind them can enjoy a real blessing. Everything that you and I enjoy today is either a blessing directly from God or it is a benefit that somebody before us paved a way so that you and I could enjoy it. And the philosophy that says, what's mine is mine and I'm just going to keep it, doesn't cut the mustard. Because trash cans need to be replaced. Restrooms decay and break down. And one of the first lessons that we learn as stewards is that I am not only responsible to take care of mine, but I'm responsible to take care of yours for the next generation. Let me ask you an honest question. Raise your hand. And this, there might be people here that, that this has happened to. Raise your hand if you have ever ate an apple from an apple tree that you yourself planted. Okay, raise your hand if you've ever ate an apple from a tree that you have not planted. Yeah. See, life is more than your circle. Every person that has gone on before you has has given and contributed are a blessing to you now. And it is your responsibility to give beyond where you are at right now. There's one more attitude that I want us to look at in in this text, and that is the attitude that says what's mine is yours and I'm going to give it. This is the attitude of the Samaritan in the story. Three people, three different attitudes. They all saw the same problem and some people think they can't give because they don't have the right opportunities to do it. Everybody in this room can be a giver no matter what your lot is in life. Whether you are a millionaire or you are in debt up to your eyeballs, you can give. 
If you are one of those people who thinks that you have nothing to give, let me, let me expound on the Greek for you from the original language clearly so that you can understand what the text would say about that kind of an attitude. Baloney. I have seen the poorest of people be some of the greatest givers in life. It has nothing to do with your possessions. It has everything to do with your attitude. Here is another interesting thing about the different players in this story that Jesus told. They were all busy. They were all on a, all on a journey. None of them woke up that morning and thought, you know what, I'm going to help a stranger today. They were going someplace. They were going to do something. And I run into people all the time who say, I can't help other people because I'm busy. Wrong. You do not help people because you are or are not busy. You help people because people are more important than your busyness. The Samaritan had a reason not to help. The Jews hated Samaritans. The Jews called the Samaritans dogs. But the Samaritans' attitude helped him overcome a couple of things. First, it helped him overcome his pride. It helped him look beyond the stigma of who the Jews thought he was and and what, what he felt about Jewish people. Also, it helped him overcome giving up his conveniences. He gave up his time. He gave up his donkey. He gave up his energy, his wine and oil. He even gave up his money. So four observations from this story that I want us to to walk away catching this morning. Number one, your attitude is way more important than your ability. Too many times we look at our skills and we say, I I just don't have the abilities, therefore I, I can't. Don't worry about what you have or what you do not have. I've had people tell me if I just had a million bucks, I would give half of it to the church. Don't worry about having a million bucks. Worry about what you have right now. God will give you tomorrow what you have done with what you have today. Attitude is more important than ability. Secondly, your attitude is more important than position. Your attitude is much more important than the position that you have in life. The priest and the Levite, they had position. You know people and I know people that have great positions in life, but they are real jerks. And you don't have to be a pastor or a missionary to help someone. You are a minister already. The Bible teaches in the priesthood of all believers, we are all ministers. Third, Your attitude is more important than timing. I can't help because I wasn't there at the right time. The priest and the Levite, they had great timing. When they came upon this poor fellow on the side of the road, he was only half dead. By the time that the Samaritan showed up, he was maybe three quarters dead. There is no better time to give than right now. So finally, become an active giver now look at what jesus said to the one that he was telling this story to at the at the end of the text that we read he says go and do likewise or go and do the same those are the last words of the story those are the words for you and for me so i have an assignment for you class on your bulletin insert I want you to take your pen out and I want you to write the name of someone you know right now in your life, someone that you know who has a real need in your family, in your friends, a coworker. Who do you know who has a need? Some, someone that, that you could actually do something for. Maybe you know a young couple who has a baby and uh, they could really use a break. They could, just, they could use a break to have some time alone to just be a, a couple. So maybe you could watch their kids for them. Maybe there's a person you know who could really use a visit. They're lonely. Maybe a little needy. But you, you know they could really use a visit. 
Maybe there's a person who's having a hard time just making ends meet. Maybe you could secretly go and drop off some groceries at their door or slip a a gift card into their hands. Maybe you know someone who's been in the hospital recently or been sick and you could go and help with some things around their house. Maybe you could send a card. Maybe you could pick up your phone and make a call. There is something. There is someone. There is a way for you to give. And if you hear this sermon, and if you hear this story that Jesus told about giving, and you don't do something this week, there's something wrong with you. You need to be an active giver. Otherwise, you're just another religious hypocrite. So give more. Give a lot. Give big. Give with your time. Give with your money. Give with your energy. Just give.